Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm back to see a good friend of mine, Lee Stoffer. Lee, how are you doing? I'm good mate, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Good. So if you're not familiar with Lee's work previously, Lee is a professional tool maker and handler as well as a very competent green woodworker. Now in this particular video, what Lee's going to be demonstrating to you is how to make a spoon knife blade box, which is essentially a alternative sheath you can make for a curved knife stroke hook knife. Now what this video is, is part of a broader series that I've previously filmed with Lee, in which we covered other styles of spoon knife sheaths. Now those videos have proven to be very popular so far. Now if you haven't seen those videos, what I'm going to do is put links below to the entire series. Now. If you don't know what a blade box is, don't worry, we're gonna be looking at some examples in a moment. And a couple of things to mention. Number one, I've broken this video down into mini chapters so you can follow along. So if you look on the timestamp below on this video, you can jump to a particular section. What you can also do is if you look at the description below this video, I've mapped everything out. If you click on that little time part on the left-hand side, YouTube has a very cool feature where you can jump to that specific section. Now this video is going to be very detailed with no stone left unturned. This is a style of shift that I'm looking forward to seeing being made. I'm not seeing yeah. it in its entirety. Um, so you're gonna be in for a real treat as Lee's gonna show you step by step how to do this. Now, what we're gonna do, we are gonna look at some examples in a moment and what Lee's also gonna be doing is breaking down kind of the steps as we go throughout this video. Another thing to mention also is needless to say, I will be putting a link down below to Lee Stoffer's website and Instagram should you want to go and check him out. So Lee, with your kind permission, I think we'll get started. Yeah, let's do it. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video where Lee Stoffer is going to be showing you how to make a spoon knife blade box. Right, so this, this is the original, if you like. This is a solution I came up with after I stopped making the, the leather sheaths for the spoon scorps that I make. It's just this little box located with a peg. So the blade sits into a recess. Actually the handle registers just into the box as well. And then there's a peg that just presses in to hold it in place. So that's kind of evolved a little bit. I had to make a slightly different size for the bigger one. So that's got two pegs. And just to minimize the actual size of the thing, I've cut the slot in a slightly different way and then made it more shaped like the blade. But this works obviously for a complete loop. It will hold, hold that in place, but it can also work for a conventional spoon knife. As long as it's got a reasonable kind of return on the hook there. You don't want something that's too, you know, too much of an open sweep because there's not really anything for the peg to register on. You can see with this, the handle sits over to one side. That's not a problem. So if you were looking to make one for a knife more like this, there's just not so much for the peg to locate on. So we'll look at a, an option for a more open sweep hook knife in another video. But you know, it'll work for anything basically large or small as long as they've got this return on the hook so we'll look at making one for this knife today i think because it's you know this is a nick westerman hook and it's very similar sort of shape at the top end there and it's got plenty of space for that peg to register and hold so that's what we'll be looking at doing and there's lots of ways we can start. You can see this started off, you know, it's just basically a square rectangular piece of timber. I've kind of evolved them a little bit. Um, so I found this old mustard tin and I quite like the shape of it. So now the blade boxes I'm making are more, this more rounded shape, which is quite, yeah, you know, it's just quite nice in the hand, quite a pleasing shape to look at. But basically you can do anything you like. The hand, the wood that I've put the handle on for this knife came out of this log here. I'm not even 100% sure what it is, but it's got this really nice surface finish. So what I'm gonna to look to do is actually take a piece of wood out so we can leave this nice surface finish on the front. So the peg will kind of go in this front part here. So we're looking at cutting that out. So I think that's what we're gonna start with. You could just start with a chunk of timber. Your average knife is, you know, you're gonna need something just over 40 mil by just over 30 millimeters. And that's gonna, 
accommodate that. So yeah, that's what we're looking at doing. So let's make a start. So Lee, just before we get into the measuring and whatnot, yeah. um, a question some people may have watching the video is about using a piece of greenwood to carry out this project. So what would your kind of advice be in regards to that? Yeah, I would definitely use seasoned timber for this. I mean, the last thing we want to do is to put a nice steel blade into moist timber because it's going to encourage it to rust. Um, and also its dimensions are going to change as it dries. So it could split, it could move, it could end up pinching down on the blade. I mean, we're going to have some tolerance in there, but yeah, I always start with seasoned timber for this in much the same way as I usually use seasoned timber for a handle. So this, this has been cut and it's, it's really dry. It has been, has been kicking around for a while now. So it's had plenty of time to dry. And, and in terms of just, sorry, just a quick second question with the timber. Yeah. Um, is there a recommendation in terms of softwood, hardwoods, or is it just anything that you've got? I'll be perfectly honest, I normally use pine. I use a softwood because when it comes to drilling it out and shaping it, it's just a much easier material to work with on that front. It's still pretty tough and resilient. Um, it doesn't have to be like as strong as a handle. Um, so for ease of working, I usually use, use pine, which is absolutely fine. That's, you know, a standard. But yeah, this stuff, this is still the same material. It's just been dyed basically with this with a wood stain but for those watching but you can i have done them with hardwoods before as well right. it's just it's just more just more effort in the in the actual like drilling part of it um which is that you could if you really wanted to go about this the old-fashioned way you could clamp this up and you could just knock this in with a mortising chisel you don't have to drill it at all but the method i'm going to show you today um uses a force and a bit because it's by far the most efficient method I've found for, for taking a large amount of material out and leaving a nice flat bottom to the hole. Um, so, the, I mean, what we really need to do to begin with is ascertain how big, how big a slot we need in the wood, because that will help us determine how big a piece of wood that we want. So if we just take this, we know, for example, that this, this blade is a very similar shape to the blades that I normally put in these boxes. So that will kind of wiggle its way in there quite happily. So. We don't really want to have to wiggle it though, so we might make the slot slightly bigger than this one. But we can use the blade itself to measure that. If you've got a pair of these calipers, it's going to help. You could just use a ruler and give yourself a vague idea. You know, you don't have to have the calipers. So let's put that on there. We're looking at about 13, near, near close to 14 mil at the very widest part. Um, if you really measured it tight, it's probably nearer the 13 but we want a bit of space so generally for this type of size blades I go for the 15 mil bit and these these particular forstner bits I find cut very efficiently they've got a bit of a bit of fluting around the side so they don't get too hot they come nice and sharp and they've actually got quite a decent length on them which obviously becomes apparent we want to get fairly deep into the box to allow for the length of the blade so we've got the width in terms of we're going to go for a 15 mil, we've ascertained that that's going to that's going to give us an ample size to accommodate the width of the blade. So then we need to worry about how wide the hook section is. So, for argument's sake, for using the calipers, we're not going to get anywhere near the edge, but we want to measure the very widest point, right? So, at that point, we've got 29.6. So effectively, that's double double the diameter of the drill bit that we're going to use, which is which is quite useful really, because we can just basically drill two holes side by side, still have plenty of material to remove. And I'll probably leave a very slight gap so that they say, I don't have to wiggle it in, I want it to just slide in nice and neatly. And if we drill it a bit wider, we can leave the shape of the drill because it'll, it'll hug this curve quite nicely, but we can leave that and not have to do extra work chiseling these corners out. Um, so that's, that's that part. And then obviously we need to know how deep it needs to sit into the box. So the blade itself is just under 65 mil from the handle itself. I want to lose a little bit of the handle into the box as well to help it register and keep everything nice and tight. So let's say we're going to put sort of six or seven mil in. We're about just over the 70 millimeters mark. So actually we need to leave a little bit of thickness in to hold the cord for the, for the peg to locate. So if we look at this example, overall, you're probably going to be looking at about 80 millimeters for this particular style. Obviously, if we were doing a much smaller knife, it's a narrower blade, so we might be able to get away with drilling a 12 mil hole, for example, two side by side. And actually, yeah, it's about 20 mil wide. 
So yeah, two 12 mil holes side by side for that would work. And then we can do a much shorter box, like 60 millimeters of, of wood would accommodate that blade quite nicely. So this is where you know, the measuring stage is gonna be fairly important to make sure you've got a big enough piece of wood to start with. And then we need to leave an adequate amount of timber around. So if we think we're gonna be 15 millimeters this way, we wanna have at least five mil front and back. So we want it to be at least 25 mil thick. I normally go for about 30, because then that gives a nice solid piece for the peg to register in. And then on the width, again, we want to have at least five millimeters either side. Um, so if we measured that at 30 millimeters or thereabouts, we're going to want to be at least 40. So that's then then same, same sort of thing at the end, five to 10 mil extra meat in the end of the box. So that basically we've got a five millimeter, five to 10 millimeter wall around the blade and it makes a reasonably strong box. You could go thinner, but it's, it's likely to have weakness. See, look, if you look at this, it's the same dimensions, but all I've actually done is effectively just taken the corners off. So there's still that thickness kind of where it counts. So that's, you know, the next, now we've established that we can make this, it helps to, it helps if you've got like a square shape to start with. So the first thing we'll do is like knock these corners off of this. Um, and again, you could do that with an axe and a knife and a plane. I happen to have a bandsaw, so I'm just going to run this through the bandsaw to knock out basically this shape to give us the piece of timber about this size and shape to work with because it's just easier to hold it in a vise when it comes to putting the holes in. Right, so we're just going to cut this out. I always find it's helpful to have an extra piece of timber just to clamp against so I can keep my fingers as far away from the blade as possible. But because I've marked this shape on the top, we're just gonna run it through vertically and go from there. Right, so we've got a decent, a decent billet off of there now. It's a bit bowed here. Um, the bandsaws don't cut dead straight, especially on smaller pieces of timber like this. So I'm just gonna put it in a vise and just clean it up a little bit with a plane. This is just gonna help to keep everything registered and it'll hold, hold nicely in the vise as well. Just square the sides up a little bit. So at home, could, if people don't have this, could they use a bit of sandpaper or? Yeah, you could do, yeah. Yeah, it just cleans it up a little bit. I'm really looking to get those sides parallel. It's not it's not that important, but, but the, when we're gripping this to drill the hole, if the sides are fairly parallel, the grip will just hold a lot better. The vise, sorry, will grip a lot better. Um, if we look, it's slightly fatter at the bottom here than here. So I'm gonna put it this way around in the vise. And I'm actually gonna take a little bit more off of this side first. I'm just planing across the grain just to reduce the thickness there. And then we're gonna go with the grain. In fact, there's a little bit of a knot there, so I'm gonna just flip it around and see if it cuts better this way. That's all fairly uniform now. We've come nicely down to the lines that I marked. So now we can mark it up on one end here to actually drill the holes. Right, 
Right, so I've got the, the Forstner bit set up in here now. We're going to drill the end, the, the hole of the slot in this end of the box. So I'm going to look basically roughly for centre and put a line across it that way. Then I'm going to go roughly for centre this way. Close enough, I think. We could double check if we wanted to, I guess. That we've got 23 and a bit there. Yeah, 23 and a bit there, it's close enough. So I'm going to drill a hole slightly, slightly to the side of centre both ways. So I'll maybe start the drill bit a millimetre off centre either way. Um, and I'll obviously want it centred front to back. Now obviously the depth of the hole that we're going to create, we worked out that we want to come down about 70 mil into here. So we're going to be all the way, we're going to be getting on for all the way in there with the hole that we're going to make. Okay. So what I've done is I've set the drill up, so from the bottom face of the drill to the top of the chuck jaws, that's the depth of travel. Now this drill press has got, I think, 75 mil of travel, about three inches. So this will enable me to just basically come all the way in to the bottom of the, to the, to the chuck jaws. I can eye that up or I could set a depth stop, but for this purpose, I'm just going to use the chuck jaws as a reference. Um, so I'm going to hold this. This is called a cross vise, this little device here. Just, sorry, two little questions, yeah. if I may. Um, so do people watching, is this particular drill bit the most optimal to use? It is for this. It, it offers the least resistance. You don't tend to get like normal twist drills. That's a 10 mil. You can get them bigger for like blacksmithing. Standard ones will go up to about, I think 13 mil, so a half an inch. So the Forstner bits are what allow you to cut an efficient hole in timber. You could use a flat bit. These go even bigger. Well, they, they don't go bigger, but they go up in similar sizes. They'll cut a flat bottom, but they've also got this big lead, lead point. You could use an auger bit, but they tend to have this lead point. These just have a tiny little, tiny little pip in the middle just to register the center of the cut. So they're really good for actually cutting a fairly flat bottom. And what we don't want to do is leave like an inch of material just to allow for the lead screw to, to come into the wood. So I've set this up in this device here, which is a cross vise. So it enables me to fairly accurately maneuver the workpiece forwards and backwards and side to side. So what I can do is I can come in, eyeball this up, make sure the center point of the drill is gonna hit the center mark on here. So the center line that I've put on, I can just get, get that bang in the middle. And then I can use this one for the side to side travel. So we'll start a hole, like I said, just, just off center. Okay, so that's gonna sit there. So I've set the depth of the travel so that I can use basically all of the drill bit and know that I'm drilling to about the right depth. And you should hopefully see that this will give quite a clean hole. I would normally set up like a vacuum just to extract most of the chips as they come out. So I'll be clearing the waste a little bit, but you should be able to see exactly how this drill works and how efficient it is at removing this material. So that's, so that's one hole done. And if you noticed, I was pulling the drill out quite a lot and clearing all of this waste. What you'll find, even with these big slots and these flutes, is any drill has to extract material. So fluted drills normally are for, are for pulling out um, metal waste, which will come out in a spiral. Wood dust tends to bulk up in the hole. Um, so clearing that, clearing that swarf is quite important because it, cuts down the friction on the drill, it will make the, allow the drill to keep drilling straight. If you leave too much of it in the hole, it just ends up binding up, filling up this slot and 
basically getting in the way. So anyway, when you're drilling in wood with any kind of power tool really, whatever type of drill bit you're using, it's, it's useful to withdraw the drill and pull some of that waste out of the hole so it doesn't affect the way that it gets cut. So I've just shuffled this over now. So you say on this one, that comes across like that. Take it just the other side of center now to give ourselves a little bit of extra space in the hole. And we'll crack her going again and get to the bottom of that. So there's a prime example there of not clearing enough waste. So it's it's got enough force, it's bound the drill bit in and actually pulled it out the out of the out of the vise. So that is a lack of concentration on my part and just going that little bit too far. So I'm gonna wind this up nice and tight and hopefully I should be able to just wiggle that out. But you can see basically that dust almost formed like a hot, a hot dusty glue and, and bound that up. So actually that's that's quite a good thing that that's happened because it shows you exactly why we want to be clearing this waste quite regularly. Let's go again, make sure that's tight. I'm just gonna move this over and try and drill out this center core. Now the drill's not gonna like this. It's, it's likely to wobble around a little bit, but if I'm careful, I should be able to take most of this waste out with a kind of a central hole um, and just knock that little bit out that's joining those two together if I go careful at it. This is why I would normally have some kind of extraction set up to be pulling some of this waste out as I'm actually drilling the hole. I just have a hose. It's just incredibly noisy. So it wouldn't come across so well on camera. But yeah, that's basically got us roughly where we want to be with the slot in the wood. Right, so we've just got to clean this up now and make this flat on the sides. So I'm just going to pop it in the vise. I've just got a little packer in there to bring it up to a sensible working height. And then I'm just going to use a couple of chisels just to gently pare down just slide those down into there and get rid of those extra bits of waste this is this is the part where actually a a softwood like pine makes this this bit of the job way easier this is quite a hard wood that we're using now so i'm not entirely sure what it is but it's definitely got some decent kind of density and strength to it but you can see it doesn't take too long to clean that up a little bit. So I'm just going to flip that round. For some reason, I prefer to work prefer to work from one side. I think it's also going to be easier to film it that way. But so I'm just leaning my body weight into it and taking very small cuts. Don't, you know, you don't want to be smashing at this with a mallet at this point. Not, I don't over tighten the jaws of the vice either because I don't want to be crush, putting too much of a crushing load on this. So then again we just should have a few, a few shavings in there and hopefully now we can refine it if not but that should now house our blade and actually no we need to take a little bit out just on the corners. So that's where a finer chisel can come in or we could have just drilled the hole a little bit wider. It's because of the tightness of this radius. So I'm just going to come in with a slightly smaller chisel now, cut into those corners a little bit. So this one's about the width of the, of the hole you see, or the mortise. I'm just going to run that down the sides, and then come down like that. We can just open that up very slightly. I say, the old, the old school way of cutting a mortise like this would have been 
with just a just a particular type of chisel so you could have just started the process like that if you haven't got a drill press you could just drill some smaller holes with a hand drill and then maybe come at it with the chisels just to clean it out Hopefully we're about there now. Yeah, we're not far off now, so another couple of passes with that and we'll be getting that blade in there, no problem at all. This is where nice sharp chisels are obviously gonna be helpful. So I got rid of that now. Hopefully, there we go. So that just drops straight in there now and you can see that really complements that finish on there really complements the handle. And by the time I've oiled the sides up, they'll actually match. But there's some work to be done there yet. So, but that's the slot cut, which houses the blade nicely with a little bit of space. So it's not too tight. We're not actually rubbing the blade on it as we put it in. Right, so the next stage that I normally do before I finish this end or any of the rest of it is to make some accommodation for some cordage that's going to hold the peg on. Now you don't have to make the peg captive to the box, I just think it's pretty useful if when you pull it out it stays attached, you can't lose it. Right, so I put it on a bit of leather cord generally. This is a flat one, a flat bit of thong there which works. I've also got this round stuff which is quite nice this is what we're going to use so that's about two and a half mil so I've got a three mil drill bit to let the cord through but then when we put it inside we want a knot to locate it in place so if you think about when you've tied a knot in the end of this that's going to pull down to be a bigger thing and we want to kind of accommodate that knot in a little hole to make sure it stays in so what I'm going to do is take a five mil drill bit and remember I went down the center of this with the forstner bit there's still a tiny little mark like a little um, like a little pit that the center of that drill leaves that I can register this on and I'm just going to drill this a couple of mil deep so I'm holding it just sort of like putting my fingers near the chuck and I don't want it to go too deep I don't obviously don't want to come through the other end because then the cord would pull all the way through I just want to make enough of a recess to house the knot So we've got a little recess there in the middle. Now the reason I drill the big hole from the inside first is because I've found in the past if you drill a small hole first the big drill will, will bite and pull into that hole so you can end up going all the way through. Now I've kind of set this up so that by the time even if I go all the way to there I'm not coming all the way through you see. So by the time this, this drill actually bottoms out on the, on the face of the box I've set the drill bit up as such so it can't come all the way through. But I want to just make sure that's as deep as I can go. It's hard to actually see with this light. Make sure I'm in the middle. There we go. So we've got a nice enough room there for that not to sit in. Now I'm going to switch it out and put this thinner drill bit in. So this is the three mil and this is an extra long three mil bit. So if I hold it just in the end of this track it should be long enough that I can come all the way through. Okay, so I'm going to find the centre of that other hole again. And I'm putting this on a piece of scrap so I don't end up drilling holes in my bench. There we go. So we've come through the top of the box there. So that, that will be where, when we put the cord in, we'll post it in through that hole feed it all the way out, tie the knot and then pull it back to put the peg on it. So that's just a nice thing to get done at this stage 
it gets it in the right place at the right depth and then we can finish this surface and if there was any kind of tear out from the drill coming through we end up cleaning that up as part of the same job. Right so the next job I usually do is to put the hole in for the peg to locate so we need to work out where that needs to be so the first thing I'm going to do is just double check fairly accurately the depth of the, the hole that we've got so I'm going to use the calipers for that if you haven't got a pair of calipers you could just use a piece of wood put it until it touches the bottom of the box and then put a mark on it and use that as your measure on the outside okay but I've got the calipers so I'm just going to lay that on there you can actually lock these ones off as well which can be quite handy so that's the bottom of the the hole effectively there now we want that to effectively hold that so the blade can't go in any deeper than that line so we want to come back at least the thickness of the blade so if we look at it this is going to be the front I always put it in so the spine goes in facing the peg because then you're less likely to cut the peg as it goes in so if we flip the whole thing over and we say that that blade can't come in any further than that line right because that's the end of the hole we touch that on there then we work out the thickness of the blade okay so that's the curve of our blade there then we come with a center line roughly there so we want to measure off if we use a, a nine millimeter peg for argument's sake we want to drill the hole four and a half five millimeters off where that blade's going to sit so if we put this in there make sure it's nicely zeroed and then bring that out to let's for argument's sake give ourselves a little bit of space to play with let's go for five millimeters thereabouts so just so I'm understanding this correctly, yeah. in terms of the room for manoeuvre yeah. between the peg and the bottom of the inside of the sheath, yeah. um, and obviously the knife fits in between that, yeah. how much wiggle room do you put, or do you put as snug as you can? Yeah, I like it to be quite snug. <laughs> if, the, if you think about it, if that peg is actually kind of gripping the blade against the top of the box, there's just less chance for it to rattle when it's on there. Right, so it makes everything that bit safer. By the time we've cut this little this little recess in, so that that kind of say so this is a pretty good example. This this sort of fits out the box. So we wriggle that in, and then a bit of the handle goes into that box. So that stops it twisting side to side, and then the peg actually stops it from pulling back out. So if it registers everywhere, reason we thought it doesn't rattle, it can't move around too much, and everything's as as protected as it can be. I mean, I suppose with time the peg's going to wear a little bit, the hole in the box is going to wear a little bit, so it might end up rattling a bit over time. I don't know how tight the original is. See, that's that's still pretty tight. That doesn't isn't, it doesn't pull in and out. It doesn't rattle backwards and forwards or wiggle. So you can. I don't know if the camera will pick it up. You can just about see the inside of the blade just glinting, catching the light there. Maybe if I move it around a bit. So as that peg goes in, it's kind of just resting up against that blade and holding it fairly tight into register so we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to get it reasonably accurate but so if we've come down from the top of the blade five millimeters that gives us you know like half a millimeter of play basically which I think is a pretty tight tolerance now we're, now we're gonna have to take this round now this is where if this was a dead square piece of timber and the reason I'm doing this at this stage is I can just scribe that round that coming off the top face come round to about the middle there and put myself a mark where that is we can rub this off I've already oiled this surface so then we've got to work out is that blade actually going to sit about in the middle and be in and for the handle to be you know we could we could just put it in wonky like that but if the blade's fairly straight it would be nice if that so we might be sitting the, the handle off to one side very slightly to get the center of the blade in the center of the peg I think it looks better when the peg is kind of in the middle of the box but it doesn't have to be so again if we now we've got that line so if we again roughly by eye put that in about the center we can double check again how accurate we've been so we've got 23 and a bit actually we're a bit we're a little bit off so we can come over a tiny bit there so we're looking at about 24 by the looks of it either side so yeah that's about there and now what I would normally do just to make give the drill a chance is to just use a little a little gimlet and just put that on my point and just give that a little bit like putting a center punch on metal it just gives that drill somewhere to register 
Okay, so and once that's once that's there, we could drill this completely by hand. But I'm just gonna give that a little wiggle and make that quite prominent. And then we can take this out in stages if we like, but while we've still got these, we're gonna knock the corners off, the sharp edges off of this in a minute. But while we've still got this nice straight sides that we can grip in that cross vise again, we can position this fairly accurately, actually set the depth of travel so that the drill puts a little, a little bit of a hole into the back end for the peg to register there, but doesn't come all the way out the back. So we can actually set the depth of travel there. You could do the same thing by measuring it and just putting a bit of masking tape on your drill if you're going to do it by hand. Right, so we're going to put this hole in again using the drill press. Um, so I've basically got a, a wedge here because I've got a depth setting on here. I'm going to, I've just marked up where on the wedge where it's about half the thickness of the bottom of the box. So if I then put that on the face of the on the bottom of the crossbar where this is going to sit effectively this will be the back that sits on it nice and flat so if i then bring the drill bit down so it touches on that line not too much pressure then i can bring this little collar around and slide it round and lock that off so effectively that sets the depth of the drill so if you get in nice and low there's as you probably be able to see that drill's not going to come through all the way to the bottom okay it's hitting a stop so I can't then physically drill too, too far. So that's the, probably the most accurate way of doing it. It's not entirely necessary, but if you've got the kit, you might as well use it. So now I'm just gonna get it registered with that little pit that I put in. I want the center of the drill bit to find the very center of that hole, because we've measured it quite accurately. So we wanna make sure it sits exactly where we want it to be. So that's gonna find the center. As I say, this is a nine millimeter drill bit. And we've found that center point now. Drill bit sitting nicely in the middle. So let's just drill that hole to full depth. gone all the way through but not through the back but I don't know if you can see you probably won't see but I can see there's just a little recess in the back of the box so when the peg goes all the way in it just stops it wiggling around too much so again whilst we've got square sides I can actually grip it back in the vise here especially if I do it this way around actually just grip up those square faces and just soften these edges again with the hand plane it'll take a little while because it's not taking much of a cut but it's just helping to reduce the bulk of this box um, so that's going to take a while with that particular plane because of the way it's set up but we could also just take a regular carving knife and start to carve some of this material back depends on what sort of finish you want to go for obviously but we've got plenty of material to come off there so this isn't a bad shout to get rid of the worst of it what I would normally do to put those those curves into it is actually use a, a belt sander so we'll do a little bit of this by hand and then I'll show you the process that I'd normally use just to smooth this shape out we can always quickly run over it and get rid of these pencil marks as well we can just take off these sharp edges up here but let's say so we get rid of the bulk of the waste without too, making too much noise and dust that's not a bad shout and then we'll go over to the sander just to finish it off
Okay, so we're just going to cut a little bit of reference into the bottom of this box for the handle to locate, and there's not a lot of blade showing through this hole, so we don't need to take a huge amount of material off. So what I'm going to do is just leave that roughly in the position that it wants to be in, stand it up on its end, and then just mark where the handle is in contact with this blade box, just with this front face here, and then we're just going to take a little bit of material out there, so it doesn't need to be much, just to give that somewhere to register. So You could probably use the tip of a carving knife, I'm going to use a tiny little chisel, just push it in like so, and then wiggle it into the grain that way, and then just a tiny little tiny little tap from there and you can see we've just taken a little bit of little bit of that material out where the handle is going to sit just say so it just helps keep things registered stop them from wobbling about too much same again on the other side Just have a double check. It just helps to locate that a tiny little bit more, I think. Yeah, that peg doesn't want to quite go all the way in. So with the position's good, the shapes are pretty good and come a tiny little bit wider. It's always better off to start small so that we've not taken too much material away, but I can take a bit more off the outsides now, a bit more off the depth there and then just flick that waste out. This is again where sometimes the facets on a handle can help make this register that little bit better. This is just a temporary peg, we're going to make another one, but that's in there pretty firm now, it's not rattling or moving around. So this is the pegs that I normally use, these are turned on a lathe. Um, you, maybe you're not going to have access to a lathe, so you could turn it, but I'm going to show you an alternative method, so we're going to carve a peg shortly. Okay, so before we go any further carving the peg and putting the cord in and stuff, we can give it give this a coat of oil now. Um, I just normally use a, a boiled linseed oil. This is fine for this job. This one's actually the first coat, this is thinned down very slightly with a little bit of white spirit. So I'm just going to put a drop on this end grain here, you can see the colour come up. Lovely, so believe it or not, that is actually the same wood. So we'll soon see that, that colour come out now. So I'll just put a little bit round here. It's not the nicest stuff to get on your fingers this, so then it just so happens that this standard Mora clipper fits that hole quite well. <laughs> you can see I've done lots of dyeing and lots of oiling holding these things on this sheath. It works a treat. So let's get a coat of that on there. And we'll let that soak in and dry. And then we can give it a coat of the of the more solid stuff. Right, so let's look at the options for pegs. Um, there are several. Like I say, I generally will turn these pegs. Um, and I'll turn them out of a, a round dowel that I can hold in the chuck on the lathe. 
but if you've not got a lathe there's going to be options you could just cut a piece of stick that fits reasonably tight in the hole drill a hole through that and attach it obviously eventually the bark is probably going to wear away so it's best to get a bit that um, doesn't require the bark to make a make a seal that that's an option doesn't give you a lot to hold on to to pull it out the reason I do these is because that flax section if it's a reasonably tight fit it gives you something to grip and twist and actually hold on to whereas a round thing is harder to hold on to could go for a, a bigger stick um, and just whittle whittle the end down until it fits in the hole you know so we can just carve this away these obviously these sticks want to be dry because otherwise they'll shrink and they won't be a very tight fit after a while but I think what we're going to do for this one is so we can make it all out of the same timber. I've cut a couple of strips of this, but you can you can get the idea here. I just kept whittling this away. You can actually just turn it there, carve it down until it's the type of fit that just pushes into the hole. I don't want to make this hole any bigger. So carve it with a bit of a taper to it and try and get it fairly round on the end of the seat, but then just leave it a little bit wider at the top so it actually pushes in far enough to do its job and then just kind of bites that, and that could look pretty cool actually if you carved it nicely and left a slightly bigger piece on the end here but it's probably going to be quite long you could see from a previous video you could drill the hole all the way through and just put a peg so you can knock it and out it pops so we're just showing a different technique but if you haven't got a lathe to be able to turn a peg then what we can do is start off with a, basically a square piece of timber that's similar in, in its sort of dimensions to this. This is actually the same, I think it's the same timber as we cut off of this box. If not, it's a piece of walnut. It's just come out of my scraps bin. Um, so it's about 15, 16 millimeters square. So if we work out kind of what we need for a head, it's gonna be a little bit longer than that. But most importantly, we want it to go in through this hole. So how can we make it nice and round and, and accurately round. So if we first of all measure the depth of the hole, I'm just sticking a pencil in it until it goes in all the way, and that's how deep the hole is. So we want the peg part to be at least that long. I'm going to allow it a bit more so I can trim a bit off the end. So let's say at this point we just push the knife down onto the corners of the wood all the way round so that we're basically creating a bit of a shoulder. Then we can sort of roll it around and join those up. So that's gonna be where our, that's sort of the head of our peg is gonna be. Then we can come in and just carve those corners off. Because if you start with a square thing, it's pretty easy to take the corners off and you're gonna end up with a, an octagon. And then if you keep taking corners off in a fairly uniform way, you're eventually gonna end up with a round thing or thereabouts. But if we're, wanting to get it really accurately round. I'm going to keep carving these down and I'm going to have to start taking some of the flats off you see. So I'll take the what was the square flats off now. So now we've reduced it all the way round. Now I'll go back round again, taking the corners off, cutting a slight taper onto this. And then we can use another little device to help us when we get so far. We're going to have to get it fairly close to where we want to be. So I'm going to get that taper going so that it's nearly small enough that it will fit through the hole as an octagon, but not quite. And then work a little bit more on this end because we're going to use a technique or a little device called a dowel plate. So if you get a piece of metal um, and if you've used a twist drill to drill this hole, it's probably going to be a, a drill that's capable of cutting metal. So you can drill a hole that you can basically force the wood through and that's going to make it a uniform shape. So you can see I've marked these up. We've got 8.5, 9.5 and 9. We're working to a 9mm hole. So if I carve it until it basically fits as close as we can get it through the 9.5mm hole. So a little bit more to go yet. And then I can kind of come back and take this off to this shoulder, being very careful with your technique here, obviously. I'm carving towards myself, but in a very controlled way. 
is called the cross thumbs technique where I'm actually sort of resisting the cut by pressing back into that thumb. So I'm just rocking in to where I've cut those little shoulders. Okay, so then we're just bringing that back so that it gives it somewhere to finish on the dowel plate. So where we went round, we've put that little release cut in effectively. It allows these little slivers of timber to come off without, without sending a split further up here. Is the idea. Right, so let's say we're getting close now. Will we fit in the nine and a half mil hole yet? Not quite. So let's just go a bit more because we know that nine and a half mil is too big. We can actually start rounding it up a little bit now. So I'm just going to start taking up all of those, any sharp edges that there are, I'm just going to start rounding them over. And so if you took your time, there's no need really to, to put it through this dial plate. You could just drill, uh, sorry, carve a pretty neat circle. It's probably quite a good thing to practice to be fair. But say if we get it to the point where it will fit through this nine and a half mil hole. This is a piece of metal that's about three millimeters thick. So when you drill the hole, it will leave a bit of a sharp edge on here. And this has been used quite a bit. So then you want a, a hole in your bench and something to tap it with. So put it on there like that. And you'll see that it'll start to peel that wood away. Preferably that fits through there, but if not, just put it on the jaws of the vise, look tap it back out and we've got, it's given us the right size that we want. So now we can work out, if we come back here again, recut these shoulders. We can remove some more of that waste with the knife. I'm just sort of putting some pressure down on this to push the knife into that. But having this, this back in is not gonna hurt. So then I can just come in and carve back to that using the dowel plate sizing as a guide just to come back to that shoulder and this is why I left a little bit of extra material on here so that we've got an extra bit to trim off that we don't really need that's a bit on the small side so again this cross thumbs technique is quite safe if you use it properly you can't be putting too much force towards your other hand without the risk of slipping Right, so I'm just going to slim that end down a little bit more because this is going to be fairly sacrificial. Just so hopefully it fits through the nine mil hole. So there's our nine mil. Let's get that in there. So then that comes all the way through. Careful how we tap it back out. You don't want to tap it and take off too much more on the way out. But then hopefully now, that's a pretty tight fit in our hole. You could refine this again with a knife or a bit of sandpaper. Generally, I'm just gonna taper the end back a little bit because what I like, these, the way I like these pegs to fit is to have a tight spot in the middle. So effectively, when they go in, they're loose to begin with, then a tight spot, and then they kind of click into place. So if you look, they're very slightly barrel shaped. Their widest part is around here. Okay, so we can either carve that in, or in this case, we could use a slightly smaller eight and a half mil hole and just tap the first, the first section of the peg into that. Not all of the way. Knock her back out again. And that should have made that a slightly looser fit and we can just refine this with the knife or with a bit of sandpaper or a scraper even. I quite often actually use a scraper. Let me just grab one. So if you've got a scraper with a slightly curved face on it, that would be quite good at just cleaning that up. Okay, and then if we want to, we can just come around here with a knife again and make that end a little bit tapered as well. 
don't cut too much off here because we want to keep some strength in here so we don't want to go too deep with these cuts better off make, peeling shavings back at this point to make that bit thinner and then rolling around with the knife to take the shavings off rather than cutting too deep into this part right so then that we know is going to be too long but it's going into a tight spot there so now we can basically put our pencil back in work out exactly how deep we want it to be to this point mark that off there so we can just trim that to length now that's why i slightly overdid it with the eight and a half now we can see that came to about there so that gives us an easy start just take that sharp edge off again you can use a bit of sandpaper if you prefer so that should fit quite nicely in there now so now all we need to do is decide how much actual peg we want flatten these sides off so i would probably well i've still got a decent amount of stick to hold on to actually come in and carve two flats down basically to the size of the peg. Okay, so I'm pretty much blending that in, but leaving a slight like ramp on it, if that makes sense. So I'm carving down into the wood, like so. Do that on opposite faces. So I've got it on that side, turn it 180 degrees, put it on that side too. Rain's misbehaving there, so we need to be a bit more careful. Right, now we can decide to maybe bring it in this way a little bit as well. Just for the fun of it, knock the sharp corners off. Bring this face in a little bit. I think the important thing is having a bit of a taper on it, so you've got something to pinch with your fingers. So then we can probably come back to about here and maybe just saw it off. Or you could go with the old technique where you kind of just rock the knife in so you don't have to have a saw technically. Mark this space up where we're gonna want the peg to be that length and then we could carve into it and gradually weaken that. We could actually at this point just knock those corners off as well. There we've got that stop cut. And then we can just run in there with the saw. Just wanted something to hold on to, you see, that's the main aim of this. Then we can just clean those edges up. And then in the same way, we just want to be able to drill a hole in this. So this is where actually I would have been more sensible if I was doing this all by hand. I have a little jig that I hold this with normally. So I was gonna do all this by hand. If I'd have left that on, I could have actually clamped that whole thing down to drill that with the hand drill. The fact that I didn't do that, um, <laughs> I'll show you the little jig that I use. Let me just grab it. Right, so we've got our little peg. This is the little jig I've made. It's just a scrap of plywood couple of little um, bamboo pegs in it which just grips that it gives you something a little bit extra to hold on to normally I would take this over to the drill press and hold this in the cross vise again and set set the drill in the drill press but we'll just do this by hand just to show you I'm just going to mark the point where I want to drill with the gimlet again so that's where I'm going to put my little five mil hole again don't want to go too deep Gently does it. This is just a house of knot. Okay, so I've gone literally less than halfway through. And I'm going to pop in three mil. And finish that hole off. So we've got a hole all the way through there now. So at this point, we can actually attach the peg to the box. Let's just give this peg a quick coat of oil as well. So hopefully come out the same sort of colour. 
I'm not going to go too mad with oiling the bit that goes into the box itself, just the bit that we'll hold on to because that's going to have the core through. Right. So let's get a little bit of this. And the way I normally do this is go through the big hole of the peg first, then into the box. until it comes out the bottom. And then we can tie the knot that catches on the inside of the box and it's just a quick overhand knot will do that. Keep it fairly tight, you can tie it a bit with a bit extra and then just trim any excess off. Don't want too much otherwise it might get in the way of the blade inside. So that's that and then pull that and you'll feel, if you pull it, you'll just feel that knot just sink down into that little hole on the inside. It's hard to show on the camera, but it will do that. We might be able to show it on the peg. And then I normally put the peg in, pull that through, and to get a nice sensible amount, I just take it all the way around the back and to the back of the box. And that seems to be a decent amount for me. So just cut it off there, tie another little knot in it. Cinch that up with not too much sticking out the end. And then so we put it back and you see that just pulls down that knot, pulls down into that hole and it should stay in there quite nicely. So then we've got a captive peg, which means once it's in, you've got enough of a loop to hang your tool up. If you want to keep it nice and tidy, you can just wind it up so it stays out of the way. So you want it to be a reasonably tight fit to begin with. If it's too loose, obviously, it's going to wear a little bit with time. But there we go. On blade box. Right, so there we go. We've done this one from scratch on camera. So we've got the peg all fastened, it all fits in nice, secure. And then we've got this other selection here as well because this was the other one that we looked at. We quickly knocked this one up off camera to a more of the design that I normally use. Same thing, just a much smaller blade and you can see in this case the slot for the handle is slightly offset. And I've actually recessed because it's such a short blade I've recessed the handle into the box that little bit further. So actually, just as a push fit, because it's got a tapered handle that works. Peg, just for a bit of extra security. That's a nice piece of walnut we put on there. And then obviously, these, you know, this is where the original idea came from. So anything from a loop to a hook that goes at least past the top of the, about past 12 o'clock if you're looking at it that way it's going to work with this whole peg system to keep it fairly safe and sound. So there you have it my friends, that is a wrap for this video. Lee, thank you so much. You want to welcome mate, my pleasure. So as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, a couple of things. Number one, this is part of an ongoing series on making variations and different styles of spoon knife sheaves. The links to all the other videos will be down below in the description. Be sure to check those out. Another reminder also that this video has been broken down into different timestamps. So it's a lot easier to follow should you want to follow along, which is our encouragement to you, hence why we're doing these videos, to give you some inspiration about different styles that you may want to make. And a final reminder, that in the description below this video, I'm gonna put a link to Lee Stoffer's Instagram and his website. He's very active on his Instagram, so it's a great way of keeping in touch with him, seeing what he gets up to on a regular basis. And he also, he has a plethora of content 
that he's taken beforehand so you can get a lot more idea of the variations of things that he does, the tools, the carvings, etc. So Lee, a sincere thank you once again no worries, for having me down. Guys, hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From myself, Zell Outdoors and Lee Stoffer, peace out.